Greece, 5th century BC. Over the course of three decades, led by one man, a city and its people rise to greatness. This is Athens, the birthplace of democracy. But it is Pericles' city. Pericles decided that the best way to leave an indelible mark on posterity was to completely alter the skyline and appearance of the center of his city, Athens. Pericles builds impregnable fortifications, the first Senate house, a complex network of pipes to supply his people with fresh water. He builds the most powerful navy in the ancient world, and he builds temples. One, the Parthenon, will be hailed by many as the most perfect building ever completed. I think he did have a vision for what Athens should be, and seemed to follow that vision for most of his life. After two and a half thousand years, we can show this vision again, recreate this lost world as Pericles saw it, the greatest city on Earth. fifth century BC from the hundreds of competing states that make up ancient Greece one man leads his city to greatness the city is Athens and Pericles is not a king or prince but an elected man his power comes from the people and from his own single-minded vision the story goes that when Pericles' mother was eight months pregnant with him, she knew that she was going to have an extraordinary son who was destined for greatness because she had a dream that she gave birth to a lion. And for the ancient Greeks, the lion was always a symbol of leadership. To be a successful politician and statesman in Greece, he needed to be a military leader, and he needed to be a, an effective speaker in the assembly. And he was clearly both of those. Pericles not only contributed to Athens becoming a leading power, I think he was the main uh, creator of that power. Pericles wants to send out a message to the world that Athens is supreme, the capital of a new empire. He will deliver this message by building. What he intends is the most costly and ambitious construction campaign undertaken in the Western world. He needs to fund it. In what some will see as an act of blatant theft, he raids the Greek treasury. Money, which should have been used to defend all the city-states in the region, is diverted to the glorification of his own city. And work begins on the Parthenon. Built to honor the goddess Athena, it will become the most imitated building in history, an inspiration to engineers and architects. It will take eight years to build, cost the equivalent of $100 million, and use a staggering 20,000 tons of the finest marble. The Parthenon is arguably the most influential building in world history. You cannot go into any city in North America or Europe or indeed most of the world without finding a 19th century bank facade, parliamentary building facade or law court building that isn't in some way influenced by the Parthenon. The Parthenon is a very special building uh, because of the visual impact it has on you. When you go up there, it's first of all huge, solid marble, uh, there's not a straight line in it, so that it has a lightness and a sense of, of movement. Uh, when you stand on the Acropolis and look at it, it seems almost to float. The image of the Parthenon is familiar to us, but 25 centuries of war, weather, and history have reduced this building to a shadow of what it once was. Engineer Ed McCann and architect Manolis Chorus have set themselves the task of deciphering exactly how it came to be built. 
what it looked like during Athens' golden age. Pericles' men cut marble for the Parthenon from the nearby mountain of Penteli. The team restoring the temple today get their marble from the very same place. What seems laborious, even with the aid of modern technology, would have taken months in Pericles' time. First, the marble was chiseled by hand from the parent rock. It was examined for faults, and then the business of transportation began. It was a 10-mile journey, and they bought 20,000 tons of marble blocks with just teams of oxen and rollers, this incredibly long journey all the way up the steep Acropolis to get it there. This is an astonishing feat. It would be an astonishing feat today with um, proper cars and, and so on. The most difficult part of the journey was the last part, getting the marble up a 302-foot slope. Ed McCann has discovered the ingenious technique that the Masons used for lifting. They had a very cunning system for getting the rocks up to the top. And what they did was they, they set up, they had a cart on one side with the rock on it, and up the top on the other side they have another cart full of stone with a big rope going round and over a giant pulley wheel. And then they set up the donkeys and the people all pulling down. And so they pull down and lift the rock up and then at the top they're able to unload it and then they bring the horses up here they put a rock on that side and they bring it back up and down like that so it's a counterbalance system the size of the challenge becomes even more impressive when ed and manolas calculate the weight of the marble the individual blocks were vast so they had eight cranes Yes. dotted around the Parthenon to, and these were timber cranes, yes. and they lifted these pieces up into the, into the construction. And the biggest piece was 13 tonnes, so about... Yes, the, the biggest, eight pieces uh, uh, weighing 13 tonnes each. The cranes were immensely strong, capable of hoisting a 13-tonne column. They were also very simple in design. Two wooden beams were connected by an iron bracket, and ropes were passed through a pulley block at one end. 200 men were employed on the site itself, but around the city, thousands more labored to support them. Masons, molders, founders, rope makers, transporters. Manolis, are these, are these the original pick holes? Exactly. Second stage after bringing the stone from the quarry. Uh, it is the, one of the preliminary stages. But the, la the last time someone put their finger in there it might have been two and a half thousand years ago. Exactly, exactly. Pick. Once it was in place, the most skilled masons carved the marble. Ed McCann wants to understand how they worked by trying it for himself. The key principle that underlies working the stone is working from rough, doing rough cuts with the stone through to uh, gradually getting to finer and finer stone cuts. And that's reflected in the tools that they use. So that the tool that they used for rough cutting was this double pick. It's difficult to lift and it's difficult to aim. I'm reliably informed that if you were any good with this, I could move 200 kilos, that's about twice as much as I weigh, in an hour's work with one of these. Now as you got into the, the stone and you needed to get finer and finer. You needed to use ever smaller tools. And I can put them exactly onto the bit of stone I want to hit, to the nearest millimetre. Yeah. It's much, much easier to use and I can't really go too far wrong. But of course, I don't get very much off with this. It would take me two weeks chiseling away, basically reducing the marble to dust before I'd move 200 kilograms. Once the columns and drums had been finished, they needed to be fitted together. So th this is where the original stones were put together, and these were iron clamps. Exactly. So the clamp is missing, but you see the bed and of so the original construction. And yes. this would have been underneath, so you wouldn't have yes. seen it. Always. So underneath the yes, exactly. Column. Hidden by the uh, next course, yes. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. OK. Today, damage from pollution means that the Parthenon needs extensive restoration. As Ed McCann hunts for clues about how the stones were originally put together all those centuries ago, he gets exclusive access to the work that's being done now. 
this is the modern restoration work that is going on. And although it's different to what they did in Periclean times, there are some similarities. I mean, first of all, the, the, the column drums themselves are the same, and they're lifted up, in this case, by a great big iron and steel crane. In those days, it would have been a timber one. And you can see in the middle there a little metal spigot sticking up. Nowadays, it's made out of titanium, but in Periclean times, that would have been wood. And that's what helps you to centre this thing. So when you lower it in with a crane, there's a little hole and you line them up and then you know you're exactly centred up. Each wall, each column is evidence of extraordinary skill. The stones are perfectly positioned and seamlessly joined. You see one of the best preserved joints uh, uh, in the Parthenon because this column was never uh, destroyed by any uh, event uh, like bombardment or ex uh, earthquake. Yeah, but these you, two, you couldn't get a piece of paper in there, could you? The outer structure required 46 of these 13-ton columns. The result was a building of unparalleled grandeur. Today, it is impressive. But as it stood in Pericles' time, it would have been breathtaking. Not just the exterior, but the interior, which has long since vanished. Our investigators will now concentrate on that interior and try to reveal it as its builders first saw it. Because the Parthenon once held the most spectacular statues ever made. What Pericles builds on the Acropolis is, in its time, revolutionary. It is at the center of his program to reform, remodel his city. This program is startlingly ambitious. It is also hugely successful. Pericles will change his world and help define ours. Pericles managed to get his dream to come true, which was to build all those beautiful temples on the Acropolis and to have his name on our lips two and a half thousand years later. And it appears that in his lifetime, these buildings were even more impressive, even more beautiful. Ancient writers describe the Parthenon's interior with awe. What they talk about is no longer here. In 1687, the Venetian army bombarded the city of Athens. The center of the temple was destroyed by a huge explosion. Now, Ed McCann and Manolis Chorus hunt among the ruins to decipher what clues are left. They want to understand what the Parthenon looked like when it was first built. This is where a Venetian cannibal smashed into the column, bang, and the lines of stress fly out and a big chunk of the marble falls off. And they're all over here. We see one there, one there. I've yes. noticed that you've got some Greek vandals. Yes. That's graffiti, it's isn't nothing, it? Yes, it is, uh, yes. One of the of 230 graffitis in the Parthenon, uh, many of them of historical value, uh, pertaining to people thanking uh, God uh, for being saved in the sea uh, after voyage uh, back to Athens and so on. A Greek sailor would have gone out in his ship and if he'd had a successful voyage, uh, exactly. he would have come yes. back to the Parthenon, climbed yes. up here and scribbled something yes. on the wall saying, thank you very yes. much, God. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Amongst the graffiti and the bomb damage, they spot other markings. Traces of pigment that suggest this whole structure once looked radically different. The conventional picture of a Greek temple is one of clean white stone, but it appears that the Parthenon was once covered in color. So the Parthenon was actually painted when it was. Yes, it new. was painted. Uh, it was a principle in ancient architecture to, to cover the buildings with paint even in marble we can now recreate what it looked like gleaming white columns were topped with gables of blue red and gold in fact no other greek temple was as intricately colored as this one in addition to the painting there were stunning sculptures there were 92 statues 
One frieze carved into the marble was almost 520 feet long. And the sculptures that adorned the gables were colossal. Yeah, I think the Parthenon is remarkable because if you look at the sculptures, and we can these days see them from behind and see that they're beautifully sculpted in the round, yet once up in the building, they could never be seen. It's hard to explain that, except perhaps the pride of the artists, the sense that they were doing this in honor of the gods and in perhaps in honor of the city. Pride of workmanship. Pericles intends that anyone entering the building will be intimidated. This is not just a place of worship. It houses the state treasury and also the ultimate symbol of the city an enormous statue of the patron goddess, Athena. Engineer Ed McCann has been trying to find the place where the statue, long since destroyed, once stood. Manolis is a bit embarrassed to tell me where the statue was because it's right underneath that rather horrible crane is where Athena used to stand in all her glory. Will you put Athena back as part of the restoration? It's impossible because the whole thing was destroyed, completely destroyed during the fire in the third century AD. Records suggest that the statue was 30 feet tall. It was clad in gold and ivory. And because it was inside the building, it could only be seen from close quarters. Any onlooker would feel dwarfed. This statue was virtually unprecedented. Pericles had it put on a plinth that was five foot tall so that when you went in, all you could see was her feet and then you gradually lifted your gaze up and up and up and up, 40 more feet until you finally came to her beautiful face, her helmet with these horses springing out of it towards the gods. The statue of Athena in Athens completely altered the uh, history of temple statuary in the ancient world and therefore probably of Christian statuary as well. And the design of the temple's exterior has proved still more influential. Throughout the two and a half thousand years since it was built, engineers all over the world tried to copy the Parthenon, but they never bettered it. Ed McCann, unlocks its secrets. One of the more famous stories about the Parthenon is how, although it's a very rectangular building when you look at it, actually there aren't any straight lines in it at all, and that the people who built it built it all with gentle curves going upwards to counterbalance a, a, an optical effect that when you look at straight lines from distance, they don't appear to be straight, and so everything's curved. And to show that, what we've done here is we've taken one of the main steps here on the Parthenon, we've put a string going from corner to corner, and here I am in the middle of the Parthenon, we can see that there's maybe four or five inches here of sag relative to the top of the step. What that means is that the step is four inches higher here than it is on the corners, and this happens all over the Parthenon. It is now possible to bring together decades of research and using the latest graphic modeling techniques, rebuild the Parthenon. Eight columns at the front, eight at the back, a row of 15 on either side. Traveling through the temple, you'd pass through a porch into the 100-foot-long sanctuary of Athena, into the treasury at the back, and out through another porch made with six columns. The Romans regarded the miracles of the Acropolis as the models for many of their buildings, and of course they then affected enormously the sort of buildings that went up during the European Renaissance. So even if it's via Rome, the Parthenon's influence always lives on in architecture. This one building alone would have been enough to guarantee Pericles' place in history. But he will do more. He is bringing a radical, fundamental change to Athens. A new set of buildings will transform the whole city and its people. Pericles 
will build democracy. High on the Acropolis, throughout Pericles' time in government, the Parthenon stands as testament to Athens' status. It is a superpower. Athens showed her dominance over the rest of the Greek world, mainly through, the, I think, Pericles' building program. But his plans aren't just about showing off to the wider world. Pericles intends to reshape the lives of ordinary Athenians. The focus of his building work shifts from the religious sanctuaries to the city below. Like modern-day Athens, it is a busy center of trade. At its heart is the Agora. The Agora was extremely important. It's a marketplace, it's a political center, it's a social center. It's basically the middle of town in all respects. Today, the Agora lies in ruins. It has in the past been attacked by barbarian invaders and built on by private homeowners. It is abandoned. But it is possible to recreate what it looked like in Pericles' time, when these 30 acres were the center of the most advanced civilization on Earth. John Camp is a world authority on the building of the Agora. He spent more than three decades trying to piece together what it looked like. Within this one plot were busy streets, a collection of temples, a marketplace, and the first ever Senate House. The Agora in Periclean times would have been quite impressive. Uh, it would have been lined with stoas, which are big, long, colonnaded buildings uh, in which you could take shelter from the sun or from the rain, depending on the weather and it will have been full of people. Yet another stunning temple was built here, very different from the Parthenon. Called the Hephaestion, it was dedicated to the craftsmen who made Pericles' vision a reality. By making this gesture, Pericles was acknowledging the root of his power. It lay in the backing he received from his people. It's one of the best preserved temples in antiquity, so it's a little hard to see how it goes together. Uh, when you come down here, you can see pieces of its virtual twin, which was set up down in the lower square. Uh, and from this, you can see that the building is made pretty much all of marble. No mortar was used. The individual pieces were held together with iron clamps, such as the one you see here, and iron dowels. And you can still see the piece of iron and a little bit of the lead used to hold it in place along with the pry hole used to get the next big block in place. Uh, this here is a step block, and everything above here in that direction would have been the second step, so all these marks would have been covered. The Hephaestion stood on the edge of the Agora, but at its center stood the council chamber. To build it, workers leveled ground, created artificial terraces, and built into the rock. The building techniques used were tried and tested, but what happened inside the building was revolutionary. This building was the birthplace of democracy. These walls here are all that remain of the old council chamber built in about 500 BC. Uh, it was a very simple building uh, with uh, mud brick walls, a columnar facade to the south, uh, and a bunch of wooden seats for the councillors to sit on. A rectangular antechamber led to a large main hall. At its center, a timber roof was supported by five columns. 500 Athenians would be allotted every year, not elected, just picked out of a hat, uh, to serve as the senators. The form of democracy they used was very simple. The council would present the people with issues for discussion litigation, taxation, or whether to go to war. Then the actual decisions were made by the people. They cast their votes by dropping a pebble into a terracotta pot. The council chamber can be compared to the U.S. Senate, but instead of allowing career politicians to dominate, it was expected that at some point in his life, every Athenian citizen would serve. Most 
democracies today are representative democracies. Athens was a direct democracy. We can compare it uh, as a working system of government to something like a New England town meeting, where everybody in the town goes to the meeting and the, and the decisions are made by everyone. Pericles Athenians also developed a way of preventing any one individual from gaining too much power. Ostracism is something we don't use anymore. It was kind of a reverse election where the Athenians had the opportunity once a year to vote somebody out of office. And the way they did it was by writing the name of the man they thought was a threat to the democracy on a piece of pottery. And the Greek word for that is an ostracon. So it was essentially being exiled for 10 years by vote of little bits of pottery. One day, a politician might be enormously popular with the people. The next, his assets could be frozen, and he might be banished from the country for 10 years. It's striking to note that is a punishment that Pericles never faced, despite dominating politics in Athens for more than three decades. His power came from the support of the people. And the humble homes of private individuals lay nearby, right alongside the mighty buildings and temples of the state. We're at the remains of a fairly typical Athenian house. This wall here going back in that direction there. That area is the open courtyard. They're very simple, they're very modest. The walls of these houses were made out of mud brick or field stones reinforced with wood lined with clay. Once finished, the walls were painted in white, black, yellow, or red. The floors were made out of simple packed clay with perhaps a mosaic pattern. Houses were built to face inwards toward a central courtyard, and each citizen was expected to connect his own home to the city's water supply. Hundreds of years before the great building projects of Rome, Pericles Athenians developed and built a highly advanced sewage and water system. John Camp found what was left of it beneath these ruins. Clean water is essential for the well-being of the city, of course, and both Pericles and other statesmen concerned themselves a lot with making sure the Athenians had enough. Uh, you see here a group of pipelines that have been uh, excavated, many of them used to bring good fresh water into the city, uh, many others used to carry the wastewater away. And literally hundreds of meters have been found uh, crisscrossing the Agora. Sections were short, three to four feet long, because they were made on a potter's wheel. Around two inches thick, they were made with a special lip at one end to ensure a watertight fit. When a length of pipe had been laid, the engineers would test for leaks by pouring through water stained with ash. Traveling in shallow trenches beneath the agora, these pipes carried water from numerous wells and mountain springs. Pulling all these elements together, the temples, the houses, the marketplaces, the civic buildings, and this highly innovative sanitation system, it's plain to see that Athens was a model city. Under Pericles, it thrived. The challenge lay in maintaining the success. As Athens grew in wealth and power, it drew the jealousy of its neighbors. Pericles had to prepare for the day when the city would come under attack. The city of Athens undergoes a transformation. With their backing, Pericles leads his people for more than three decades. Every year for over 30 years, he was re-elected head of the Board of Generals. Every year he was elected like that, he never, ever, ever failed to get that position. As Athens booms, this military side of Pericles' authority becomes more and more vital. Tension mounts with Sparta, the only serious rival to the power that Athens holds in Greece.
Pericles realizes that he needs to prepare his city for the possibility that war will come. Athens' existing defenses guard a large wedge of land, bounded by a pair of long walls and two miles of shore. It becomes clear that should Spartans attack, this is simply too great a line to defend. The Athenian forces would be overstretched and vulnerable. Though Athens is five miles inland, Pericles knows that the sea is where its power lies. Greece is mountainous. Overland travel is difficult. Most of the city's trade happens with the island states of the Aegean. So Pericles focuses attention on protecting the route to the port at Piraeus. He builds a third wall running straight to the harbor. This wall creates a defensible corridor. Though narrow, it means that whatever happens, Athens is connected to the sea. Even by modern standards, this would be a major public building project. Like the construction of a freeway, the building of the wall forces its way through private houses and farms. It crosses rivers. It divides communities and separates people from their land. But to Pericles, the disruption is a price worth paying. Athens has to be ready to fight. Today, nothing remains of Pericles' wall, but this fortification at Agasthena is very similar. It provides investigators with the best clues to what Athens' long walls would have looked like. The wall that he built would have been of smaller stones than this, I imagine, for four meters or so, 12 feet, and then above that, mud brick for another, say, three or four meters. Two external stone faces were filled with rubble. Above the foundation lay low stone called sockel. On top of that, there was mud brick. The walls were about 16 feet wide and 30 feet high. They were eight and a half miles long. It was Pericles' intention that they would be unbreachable. The key to that lay in the way they were manned. Weapons expert Mike Lodes has been investigating the way Pericles policed these defenses. He would rely on a rapid reaction force of mounted troops to travel up and down their length. The Athenians recruited 300 cavalry. Now, that's a fascinating direct link between Pericles' long walls and cavalry. This was the start of Greek cavalry. Mounted troops were a major innovation in ancient Greek warfare. Cavalry can patrol along the walls. Cavalry can be shot out from postern gates at a moment's notice to go to the moment of trouble. And cavalry can patrol the countryside to protect that agricultural infrastructure. Postern gates were located at regular intervals along the walls. High towers and ramparts offered another level of security. The Athenian police and watchmen were recruited from Scythian archers. The Scythians were these people from north of the Black Sea. And they had these wonderful, strong, powerful recurve bows made of horn and sinew. They've got a range of about 250, 300 yards. So anybody trying to lay any sort of siege work out there, these archers are going to be picking them off and they would stand no chance. It wasn't just arrows that attackers had to fear. Pericles also stationed men armed with slingshots along the walls. They were effectively the snipers of their day. And their slingshot was cast in lead, so it has weight. It's aerodynamically shaped like a bullet. This would kill a man. And in fact, this is a copy of one that's in the British Museum, an original Greek slingshot, and it says the words dexa, which means take that. It's a wonderful millennia-old bit of soldier's wit. And you simply place the sling in the basket and hurl it. Built before the development of siege warfare, these walls were never breached in Pericles' time. 
no army had the technical or logistical skill to bring them down. It meant that Pericles could confidently try to seize the advantage. He could take his country to war. The war began because there were two main cities in Greece, Athens and Sparta. Both were ambitious to be the leaders of the Greek world, and it was a case of, of two big kids on the block, and there was only room for one. So war was inevitable. The golden age of Athens was about to come to a dramatic end. Pericles plans to gamble everything he has built, everything his people have worked for, on the strength of his mighty navy. We will uncover the lost world of the Greek warship. Four thirty one BC. As Pericles predicts, the forces of Sparta invade Athenian territory and Pericles responds in a way that shocks his own people. Having strengthened the city's fortifications, he now puts all his faith in them. He orders the people of the countryside to abandon their homes and take refuge behind the walls of Athens. Many see it as cowardice. And so the Athenians watch as 60,000 Spartans rampage and destroy. Pericles' reasoning is that the Spartan army is too strong. To take them on on land would be to lose. Instead, he will carry the battle to the sea, passing troops down the narrow, protected corridor that links Athens to the harbor at Piraeus. He will attack Sparta using a fleet of highly advanced, deadly warships, his triremes. Certainly we can say that Athens had the best navy in the Mediterranean in the 5th century BC. One reason for this was because Athens' uh, income from empire allowed her to pay her crews to train longer and harder than anybody else's crews. No archaeologist has ever found remains of a trireme, but our investigators have pieced together the story of what must have been an awesome feat of marine and military engineering. The tri in trireme refers to the key innovation that set these ships apart. Three banks of oars, one on top of another, gave it massive power. Earlier board warships had rows at two different levels. By adding a third level, of rowers, uh, you got uh, half as much power again uh, within the same length of hull. So it made the ships faster and more maneuverable. From ancient drawings of the triremes, the designer's intention is clear. They wanted to use this extra power to brutal effect. Boris Rankov believes that the front of each ship was reinforced to make a ram. The ram was essentially uh, a projection at the bow of a ship and sheathed in bronze with cutting edges on, and this was used to uh, ram into other ships and knock holes in their hulls. So the trireme was basically a guided missile. The idea was that it would penetrate the hull of an enemy ship, cause maximum damage, and then move off. Success was dependent on the skill of the person at the helm. To work effectively, the ram had to impact at a speed of 10 knots. And if it was too late or too early, the trireme's vulnerable sides would be exposed. Boris Rankov believes that the ships must have been built from an extremely light wood. Flat out, they could probably manage something like between nine and ten knots. A ship of 50 tons with 200 men on board traveling at nearly ten knots is really quite impressive. Only by investigating the remains of ancient boathouses can experts estimate the size of triremes. They may have been as much as 120 feet long. Boris's reconstructions make it clear that their deployment required a massive amount of muscle, 170 men in three files, each man wielding an oar up to 13 feet long. 
Pericles' fleet was vast. Accounts from the beginning of the war with Sparta suggest that he had 300 ships at his disposal. With around 200 sailors per ship, that's a navy of 60,000 men. And there were other people on board each ship. Each one also transported soldiers called hoplites. Disembarking at strategic locations deep in Spartan territory, they would have quickly done damage to their enemy, then sailed away. Weapons expert Mike Lodes reveals the kind of tactic the hoplites used in battle. He would have vast phalanxes of hoplites, infantry armed with a spear and a shield, would charge each other. Meeting with an explosive energy, shoving and pushing and jabbing and stabbing their spears deep into the enemy ranks. It was a war of attrition. Imagine that behind Richard, there are 600 hoplites, eight to 12 rows deep. Now the first two or three ranks are gonna be able to reach with their spears into the enemy lines. But behind that, the men are muscle and weight. With these highly skilled troops and the power of the triremes behind them, it appears that Pericles has the means to snatch a quick victory over the Spartans. But that victory doesn't come. The Spartans invade and attack the walls of Athens five times in ten years. Each time they are forced to pull back but keep returning. Gradually the Athenians are worn down. And then Pericles' people come under attack in a way that they could never have foreseen. Because their ships, their greatest strength, return from foreign ports carrying disease. Thousands of people are crowded behind the city walls. And in these cramped conditions, an unnamed plague wreaks havoc. A quarter of the population dies. The Athenians, for the first time in 50 years, lost all hope. The number of them that died seems to have been extraordinary. The physical suffering that went on, people didn't die for a week or 10 days. Bits of their bodies rotted and fell off. They coughed their lungs up. They were covered in disgusting rashes. And there was probably an absolutely appalling smell of putrefying corpses on top of the smell of the foul water, which had happened because so many people were confined within the long walls and the sewage. Pericles did not escape. The man who had built the Parthenon nursed democracy through its infancy, fortified his city and led it for decades with vision and daring was as vulnerable as anyone else. He died. No one has ever been able to put a name to the disease which caused so much destruction. But recent findings suggest that all these people were probably killed by typhoid. Typhoid can be a very nasty disease. It can cause rising fever, you can become uh, unconscious, delirious, you can get perforation of the bowel, blood uncontrollably coming out of your intestines. When Pericles died in the plague, it left a huge hole in Athenian political life. And this left a, a power vacuum that all kinds of probably less able people um, strove to fill. Athens was physically and psychologically beaten. Finally, in 404 BC, after vicious internal fighting and a series of military disasters, the city was forced to surrender to the Spartans. Though the defenses that Pericles built had never been overcome, his city was humbled by its bitterest enemy. It had taken 30 years to build. Within one generation, it was brought low by war and disease. And yet this doesn't detract from what Pericles achieved. The city he built set a blueprint for Western civilization. Its influence can still be felt. Its legacy 
does not diminish.